It's time for the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is the voice of the working class, Rick Smith. And welcome, brothers, sisters, working class heroes. This is the Rick Smith Show. Thanks so much for being here today on the big program. Lots to get to. Lots to talk about. On Wednesday, uh, Boeing was the subject of back-to-back Senate hearings, uh, won by the Senate Commerce Committee. Uh, They heard from members uh, of an expert panel uh, that found serious flaws in Boeing's safety culture. Also, the Senate Committee on Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs, Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations. Um, well, they uh, they examined Boeing's uh, broken safety culture and got firsthand accounts from, uh, from people who testified. One guy getting a lot of attention, uh, his name, Ed Pearson. Uh, Ed, a former Boeing manager, now the executive director of the Foundation for aviation safety you may remember him he was the guy who uh was 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 going to be flying uh evidently had booked himself on flights that weren't planes that that he was familiar with uh no 737 max for him uh and he walked off the flight saying look i don't think they're safe and and obviously the flight attendants didn't want them to get off. Uh, they didn't, he didn't want to make a scene, but it became a story and he retired uh, shortly thereafter. And, and look, uh, his retirement, uh, two months before the first 737 MAX crash. So now testifying in front of the Senate committee and uh, the, the quote that's getting a lot of attention He says, look, I'm not going to sugarcoat this. This is a criminal cover-up. He said, records do in fact exist. I know this because I personally passed them on to the FBI. Uh, He went on to say that the manufacturing conditions that led to the two 737 MAX disasters also led to the Alaskan blowout accident. And these conditions continue. Uh, He says Boeing illegally stopped conducting thousands of quality control inspections and hundreds of airplanes left Boeing's factories without these inspections. Now, uh, we've heard this before. We've heard it in a bunch of places. And should we be surprised? This is the argument that they've been making for a long time. Corporate America has been saying, no, no, uh, let us regulate ourselves. Let us police ourselves. We'll do what's in the best interest for us. Now, understand, uh, we've seen failure after failure after failure of this play out, and yet we're still sold the same garbage because, you know, regulations are bad. Job-killing regulations. Never mind the fact that the people-killing lack of regulations. And understand, you know, it's just two planes that fell out of the sky. Uh, And their argument is, well, you know, it's not a big deal. Uh, It's only two, I guess. And, and it got me to thinking about, you know, the idea of corporations policing themselves and how they uh, they use, well, disaster capitalism to decide whether they're going to act in the best interest of you or me instead of themselves. Because that argument that corporate America is going to act in their best interest, and we, we like to believe, well, they don't want to get sued. Uh, they don't want to, you know, get a bad PR. They don't. They, and the reality is, is they don't care about any of that. They don't even care about the product. What they care about is profit. And if killing a couple of people, uh, injuring, maiming, whatever, um, if if that means higher profits, well, that's just the cost of doing business. In this new kind of deregulated environment where corporate America polices themselves. And what I found interesting, and look, this is not new. We've talked about this before. In fact, we're talking about it back when, when, uh, you know, the the two planes crashed. Not surprising, not even a little bit. Uh, One, this is what happens when you have a a near monopoly corporation where there's no competition. And two, this is where you you have a swinging door between the people who are supposed to be uh, on looking and the people who are, well, not on looking. 
But I, I kept coming back to this moment where what we were sold, and you may remember over the last several months, what, what have we heard about Boeing's problems? It, it, well, let's steal it from Elon Musk. I won't even, I won't even go to Fox News or uh, any of those. Elon. <laughs> uh, Elon was, uh, uh, he was complaining about, about diversity, equity, and inclusion. He was he was uh, worried about corporate governance. In fact, he tweeted out, uh, do you want to fly in an airplane where they prioritized DEI hiring over your safety? That's actually happening, he wrote. And I'm going, no, I don't, I don't know about that. Uh, what we know, what we know is they've been trying to kill the golden goose for a very long time. Boeing had a high quality workforce in Washington state. Uh, they had uh, people who, and we used to, we had folks on from from SPIA, the engineers who uh, who you know designed the, the planes. Uh, we've talked to workers there over the years, and it's the culture that management has created that's put put this company in peril. And you can go back to 2008 when the machinist union accused Boeing of unfair labor practices and union busting tactics while they were negotiating a contract. 2014, uh, the machinists accused Boeing of threatening to move production out of the state. We do what we say or we're moving. And really attempting to weaken the voice of workers who could raise these concerns. In 2018, uh, Boeing workers in South Carolina, they voted against unionizing uh, because, well, guess what? Uh, Boeing put down the hammer, put down the, the heavy hand. And, and again, allegations of, of massive uh, uh, you know, harassment and intimidation and anti-union union busting tactics by Boeing. 2019, the NLRB, the National Labor Relations Board, they issued a complaint against Boeing alleging that they had, in fact, retaliated against workers trying to organize in South Carolina. 2020, SPIA, the Society of Professional Engineering Employees in Aerospace, they accused Boeing of engaging in union busting tactics during their contract negotiation. Again, weakening the voices on the front line. This is about tearing apart a culture that was all about ensuring that workers had, in, had a voice, were empowered to fix things. No, no. What we're going to do instead is we're just going to pencil whip things through because it's about the profit. It's not about the people. It's about the profit. This is the story that's being weaved. This is the story that, that I, I keep coming across. And look, it's not new. You know, you know, Ed Pearson says, you know, it's criminal. And, and I agree. But sadly, nobody's going to jail because we don't do this to corporate America. We don't, we don't lock up our white collar criminals. They were just trying to enrich the shareholders. But we know this is what they do. We know that how this works. And, and sadly, we, we just kind of let it go. And this has been, in my view, the result of, of decades of union busting, decades of, of taking worker power and workers' voices away. You know, this Ed Pearson, they're calling him a whistleblower. Um, and he was, he was saying that there were problems all along and you go, um, I'm sorry. Um, you were a guy who was in charge of this. Maybe if you had some power to maybe stop some of it, maybe two planes wouldn't have fallen out of the sky. I don't know. This is what happens when you have, well, dictatorships, when you have the kind of power that Boeing exerts over its workforce. And how'd that happen? Well, I mean, we can go back decades and think about, you know, you, you go back to the ultimate union buster, Ronald Reagan, who I blame a lot of the current economic problems on. You go back to when Reagan fired the Patco workers in 81. Uh, not only did he fire them, he banned them from all future employment. And that was that one thing was the shot heard across the boardroom. Corporate America knew it was open season on workers. And you throw in Reagan's uh, anti-union appointments to the National Labor Relations Board, the Department of Labor, all of those places that were there to ensure workers had some power, had a voice. But again, this is a guy who was a former union president himself, 
uh, opposing collective bargaining for federal workers. This is a guy who was a union leader himself supporting the whole no rights at work agenda. He supported right to work, which we know weakened unions' ability uh, to fight for better wages, hours, conditions. And, you know, what he did through his budgets, again, harmful. Attacking OSHA, gutting their funding, gutting the Mine Safety and Health Administration, MSHA's budgets, gutting all of those things that keep people safe. I mean, he did all of the things you would expect from a Republican now, but back then it was a big deal. Weakening workplace protections, pushing for for massive deregulation, which, hello, look where we are. And it was Reagan who brought us that tax policy of, hey, let's give all this wealth to the wealthy. Let's give them all the money because they're smart. They know what to do with it. One of the worst presidents for working people in the history of this country because of him we have massive inequality not that we didn't have inequality back then but it has grown to epic proportions and you go well what do we do well we undo the damage of the reagan era we undo the damage that he caused Give workers the ability to fight for better wages, hours, conditions. Give workers the ability to have a voice. So when problems come up, there's somewhere to go. And maybe we don't have to have hearings years after the fact where someone goes, you know, it's criminal. You know, we knew they were pencil whipping thousands of inspections. We knew the the the, situ- the the system was incestuous with the swinging door of people going from industry to regulator to back and forth. And it's not just Boeing. So for me, what I would like to see out of this, and I know the CEO is leaving at the end of the year. I know there's um, he's got a golden parachute coming. He'll be fine. I'd like to see some of these people. I don't know truly held accountable. Now, I've had people say, well, we need to break up Boeing. I'm not 100% opposed to it. Competition's not a bad thing. But the reality is this is a giant a giant company, global company, was the biggest they've given it away because of their short-term thinking. And the bigger part of this is not, not to pick on Boeing. They're like any corporation where you give them the choice between doing what's right and doing what's profitable. They're going to do what's profitable. And that's that's just how it is across the board. And I've always said that unionized workers, workers who have the power to say no, the power to speak up in moments where it matters, and the protections to do so, are actually beneficial for the companies. Because had you had people at the beginning, you know, I don't know, a year before Mr. Pearson got off the plane, because I don't want him to be looked at as like some hero, but had they done something a year prior and said, hey, wait a second, we missed that inspection. We should go back and do that. Well, wait a minute, there's stuff getting out of here that's not, not quite right. We should fix that. If you don't understand the system, maybe, oh, I don't know, don't use it. But we're in a moment where corporate America gets what corporate America wants. So do I have any any true hope or faith that someone's going to be held accountable? I want to hear your thoughts. Email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. Uh, when do we? When do we start holding corporate America accountable? We give them so much. And we expect what seems to be so little. I want to hear your thoughts. Email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com.
Rick Smith Show. We are AFGE, the American Federation of Government Employees. We represent 700,000 federal and D.C. government workers who are the vital threads of the fabric of American life. We support our nation's military. We take care of our nation's veterans. We protect our nation's borders. We respond to our nation's crises and natural disasters. We provide services to our nation's seniors. The American Federation of Government Employees. We work for America. We are AFGE, the American Federation of Government Employees. We represent 700,000 federal and D.C. government workers who are the vital threads of the fabric of American life. We support our nation's military. We take care of our nation's veterans. We protect our nation's borders. We respond to our nation's crises and natural disasters. We provide services to our nation's seniors. The American Federation of Government Employees. We work for America. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. Ah, yes, our benevolent dictators, our corporate CEOs, and the the ultra-wealthy. And and the reason I bring this up is a lot of our benevolent dictators um, are, are, well, um, lacking in benevolence. (laughs) And I look at Elon Musk, who, you know, is is a, a benevolent dictator minus... Uh, the benevolence, obviously, obviously enough. And what what I find find weird is there was a story caught my attention. Evidently, uh, Musk put out an internal memo uh, that says that uh, Tesla is going to cut over ten percent of its global workforce. Uh, evidently, according to, to Elon's letter, you know they they've grown too fast, too rapidly, and there's there's duplication, there's redundancy. And in corporate speak, that's bad. Uh, that's bad because it's it's bad for well his his pocket. Uh, he goes on to say that the cuts are going to help them become lean, innovative, and hungry for the next growth phase. And and look, it's all about the bottom line. Understand that. Uh, it's all about hey, how much can we make? How much can we put in our pocket? And and how little can I pay you? And you know the reality is is they're gonna you know this this email was sent out and they're uh, they're laying people off. Uh, it's the the first large scale layoff I guess for workers at its Buffalo plant. Um, I guess since what twenty twenty three. Um, so you're starting to see this stuff happen, and and I guess it was done by email. Congratulations. And my mind went into this uh, into this place. Where had they had they a union? Had they a voice on the job? Maybe this doesn't happen, and maybe it, it doesn't happen this way. Um, and I guess you know they sent this memo out at midnight. Um, and and it's it's one of those things where you go, what is what's Elon doing up at these hours? Like you know. So on Sunday, evidently, workers who were were impacted by these received their email through their personal accounts. <laughs> Again, that's why you never give your employer a personal email, uh, telling them that uh, they're they're no longer needed. Uh, in fact, the email said, "Effective now, you will uh, not need to perform any further work, and therefore will no longer have access to Tesla systems or f- and physical locations." Uh, now you know. What does this mean? Well, it means that you another example of, of a very profitable company wanting more and taking it out on the workforce, which is why you are seeing, and I think about time, you are seeing workers finally coming around to the idea that, you know, we do need some some voice on the job. And look, for me, this this layoff by by Musk, this move by Tesla might actually be a good thing to wake people up to go, look, we're just numbers on a spreadsheet. We're just negatives on their balance sheet, disposable at any time. Uh, look, you know, I said, you know, had had there been a, U, a UAW union there representing those workers, uh, there still may have been layoffs. It wouldn't have been this way. There would have been a negotiation. There would have been, there would have been stuff there, or there'd been recourse. 
But again, this is why I think what we're seeing is we're seeing some momentum, especially in the South, where you haven't seen a lot of organizing activity. You've seen a lot of abuses in the workplace. And finally, some, some folks are going, maybe now is the time. And you look at the fact that the UAW is, is you know, full scale organizing uh, the non-union plants down in the South, which I found interesting that you got governors from six of those Southern states, you know, warning workers, uh, you better not, you better not join that union. Bad things will happen. Um, and look, intimidation, you know, in places like Tennessee, not new. If you remember uh, when they had the uh, uh, the Volkswagen election, you know, a couple of years ago, uh, they had all the politicians, all of the, uh, the, the, the big money people saying, well, you know, if you vote for a little bit of a raise, you know, bad things are going to happen. Uh, and is it any surprise that it's Tennessee at the front of it uh, with uh, Georgia, Mississippi, South Carolina, Texas, Alabama? Are we surprised that it's their governors who are saying, no, no, you working people, you don't need, you don't need that. Continue to be at will employees at the will of your benevolent dictator. Continue to, to take what you're given instead of what you earn. And I find it interesting that you've got these governors who are more concerned about their, about the corporations than they are about their citizens. But, you know, are we surprised? No, we shouldn't be. Not even a little bit. And, you know, this idea that, you know, they're attacking the UAW, you know, because they have serious reservations that the UAW can represent our values. Did you know they, they, they proudly call themselves democratic socialists? Uh, and seem more focused on helping President Biden get reelected than on the auto worker jobs being cut at plants they already represent. Uh, this is what the governors wrote. And, you know, you you look at the the push towards using elected officials to do your union busting. It's quite remarkable how much power corporate America has. Because Alabama, I brought up Alabama, a um, Immediately, you've got the Senate uh, that just passed a bill that would punish companies that had the audacity to a- engage in a voluntary recognition of unions uh, and their and their workers' will. Now, remember, you know my Republican friends tell us how much uh, they love small, less intrusive government. Get government out of our lives, and yet uh, they're saying that that government will be right in between the relationship uh, between you and your employer. employer. And what they're saying in this case is that any, any company that does this, any organization, any company, any anything, anyone that um, looks to the state for any economic development money, sorry, uh, if you you go against us, and you voluntarily recognize the will of your workers. We're going to cut you off. Uh, you'll get nothing. And understand, you know, as we speak, you know, the Mercedes workers uh, in Alabama are are you know, coming up on a vote to to get representation. So it seems it seems uh, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> Convenient. Seems well timed. That the vote is coming up uh, over these workers, you know, choosing their destiny, choosing whether they want to be represented and they want to have the benefits that come from that. Um, and then the scare, the scare tactics come. And look, this isn't new. Uh, Georgia, you know, has already done the same thing. Uh, in Georgia, they've actually put it on the governor's desk, Senate Bill 362, which would do again the same thing. It would punish employers that have the audacity to uh, recognize the wishes and the will of their workforce. And the, the thing that gets me is, is this is this is perpetuating that it, it has to be adversarial. 
that the company has to put up, you know, the kind of union busting campaign and the kind of harassment and intimidation that they've become famous for. Instead of saying, look, you know, we, we, should, we can partner with, with our workers. We can partner with the UAW to ensure that, that we get the best quality workforce, uh, that we keep people. But that's not corporate America today. And, and what's, what's kind of frustrating is we put up with our elected officials doing this. Because, look, Alabama, Georgia, they're not the only ones. This is, this is red state stuff. Uh, this is model legislation stuff coming from, uh, you know, a very famous legislative group. Or council, if you will. And what's the end goal? Well, the end goal is what it's always about. More for them, less for you. More for the shareholders, more for the, the wealthy, what, more for politicians that side with them. And less for you, less for the people who do the actual work. And you think about what's happened over these last 40 plus years. Where we had a prosperous middle class, a prosperous working class. And because of bad policy, because of, of corporate policy, deference to corporate interests, workers are struggling. I mean, in my lifetime, one income could support a family. And fairly reasonably. I think back to my grandparents. One income, one working class income could support a family. And what's happened? Well, uh, they've gutted wages, stagnant and declining in many industries. In fact, I just had someone today go, oh, they pay us all this money. I go, yeah, it's less than it was 30 years ago. Our standard of living has dropped over the last 30 years. And the question is, is, when will working people say enough and start looking at these politicians for who they are? Part of the best democracy money can buy. And when will we start running for things? When will we start pushing back on, on these, these policies? This isn't going to make any working person's life better. This isn't going to put food on the table. This isn't going to help keep a roof over anyone's head. This isn't about helping you or me or, well, any working person. You know who it's about. It's about ensuring the wealthy stay so. Will we put up with it? Probably. Want to hear your thoughts? Email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So the question, I, I think a lot of folks are wondering, will we see another clown show uh, in the U.S. House of Representatives? Will we see a, another speaker go the way of Kevin McCarthy? Will we see uh, Republicans showing us who they are? And as I said yesterday on the program, um, I think... I think what the Republicans are showing us is they want Hakeem Jeffries as speaker. I think I think what they want is really what they really want is Nancy Pelosi as speaker uh, because they clearly don't have the ability to govern. And here to share some thoughts on, well, what what can we expect out of uh, the unexpected nightmare uh, that the Republicans have have shown us in the House of Esther, good friend, former Ohio congressman and political analyst Bob Nay to come share some thoughts. Bob, thanks for taking time for us. Thank you, Rick. So, we're, we're going to see another uh, another clown show, or will do you think the Democrats will bail them out if it goes that far? Well, just think about this. When I was in Congress, when I first went there, we had the the Gingrich Clinton battle of the of the decades, right? It it, it was a love fest. <laughs> Today, it's one battle, and it's Republicans. You're right about the Republicans wanting uh, Nancy Pelosi back because. Hakeem Jeffries doesn't register on the scale of look what he's going to do to you yep. uh, because they haven't done anything on the Democratic side to cause that to happen. 
uh, because the Republicans have taken full frontal war with each other in the U.S. House. And so now Speaker Johnson was smart. He divided the entire funding process for these, I'll call them foreign bills, into four parts, a separate Israeli bill, a separate Ukrainian bill, a separate Taiwan bill. And then, of course, he's going to do this is sort of like a Rick, like a, a fire sale. You got this bill, that bill. And by the way, we're going to give you a bonus bill on the border. How about that? So he's adding the bonus bill on the border, which will, of course, uh, if you satisfy. act now. <laughs> yes, if you act now, you get the bonus bill on top of it. You get instant deportation. How about that as a fire sale? So he's going to do that. Now, this technically saves him with a lot of members because you have your chance to down the Ukraine bill with your vote. But remember, and you know this, this is this is thinking in the old days is where my mind's going, where, well, I had my chance. I voted against the Ukraine. Uh, I'm not going to throw the speaker out over it. I lost, but, you know, I'll move on for another battle. Right. It doesn't work that way. Marjorie Taylor, three names, which I put now in my reports. I, I have to credit you for that one. Marjorie Taylor, three names is, you know, out, out for blood, of course. Uh, she's getting hit so hard by most of her colleagues on the Republican side, but that doesn't necessarily stop her. So we have to understand that Marjorie Taylor Greene, by the way, I consider to be the worst Republican in America, literally the worst. That's saying because something. People, well, well, people, they'll say to me, well, she's a patriotic, good Republican. No, she's not. She is willing for personal reasons, personal publicity personal style of how she wants to work because she doesn't want to work. She's willing to burn the house down. She's willing to take the Republican party out of the house. If in fact she's successful in vacating that seat on the speaker, even after all of this, even after he separated the bills, which gives her her chance to vote against the Ukraine. If she's successful, it is over with ground zero done for the Republicans. They will not, control the House in, in November, it will be Speaker Hakeem Jeffries. Now, the wild card here is the Democratic side. Yeah. Who, again, like I said, right now, there there's no national polling where people say, oh, Hakeem Jeffries is going to take away your democracy or your freedom. It's not out there. So he, he as an as a individual uh, leader of the Democratic side in the House, and his caucus are in a a very enviable position of, you know, being in a better place than the Republican side. But they're going to probably, if Marjorie Taylor Greene has her uh, has her way, they're probably going to have to make a decision. Do they bail out the Speaker or do they let, you know, the Congress uh, go into chaos? They're going to have to make a decision, probably. Yeah. And look, you know, the, and the Democrats might have the opportunity to go, look, we want something. Uh, we'll save you. Uh, at least, you know, this is how my mind works. Uh, we'll save your speakership, uh, but we, we've got some stuff that we need to get done. We, we've we got an agenda that the, the White House wants. We've got some stuff that we need. Uh, you've got to move this. Well, now, here's the other thing, too. Uh, if, if they do bail out the speaker, the Democratic side, they really need to make this an event. They need to build it up. They need to have the press conferences. They need to get four to five to six days of media out of this, of why they're doing this for the good of the country. They don't want the floor to go into chaos when we are in global threats. First of all, they don't want the floor to go into chaos with ongoing situations of education, education funding, the budget, inflation, gasoline, you know, all the domestic issues. No, the world's on fire. I mean, we we, yeah. we can't be, as the world leader, we can't be sure. this dysfunctional in this, this yeah. important moment in history. Right. And so they've got plenty of domestic and international reasons to be able to, to you know, I'll just say politically milk this, which they should, because they, they need to not just say, oh, yeah, okay, by the way, we're, we're going to vote and, and bail you out, and uh, we know you appreciate it. No, they need to build up as to why, because it shows leadership on their part. It, show, it would show them willing to reach across the aisle to actually save a Republican for the good of the country. And then behind the scenes, they need to make it also clear to the, just like you said to the speaker, hey, we have an agenda that helps America, and we want 
your word on what you're going to do with that agenda or giving us the chance to, you know, to do amendments or to put forth bills. Sure. So it, it can be a win. Now, I have friends of mine that are saying, oh, no, they, they need to just let the Republicans go for two months. Well, it's true. The Republicans would probably go for two months, but it, it would be such a, a chaos and, and a chaotic point that eventually, look, the whole system will get blamed. No, look, at the end of this, I'm I'm very much someone who says, you know, if, if you know, someone's uh, doing harm to themselves, uh, you know, and, and it's, these are self-inflicted wounds, you go, you know, let them go, you know, that whole thing, give them enough rope and, uh, you know, they'll hang themselves. But uh, mm-hmm. this is much bigger than just, just the party right, left, uh, red hat, blue hat. We're in a moment you know, that... I don't know. Without funding going to uh, to Ukraine, we could end up seeing Ukraine go down. Without yeah. being involved in what's going on in Taiwan, who knows what happens there? Uh, and look, yeah. I don't like what's going on in 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 the in the Middle East. But if that Tinder block box explodes, uh, well, hello, World War Three. I don't know if you saw the story the yesterday the other day. Uh, Gen Z is now googling World World War Three, and can I be drafted? Because, you know, the message now is, you know, with Iran attacking Israel, um, who knows where this goes? Right. So these are these are some of the most precarious times we've seen in modern America. And it's all coming at one point in time, right in the middle of a presidential election. Uh, the, The worst thing that McCarthy, the outgoing previous speaker, the worst thing he conceded to. The one thing he should not have conceded to, no matter what, was one member being able to vacate the chair. When he did that, he created a potential system for such chaos. That was the one thing that he should not have yielded. Well, he he wrote his own ouster paper. I mean, everyone knew when he agreed to that, that was going to happen to him. He had to even know. And as I said, look, uh, he wanted to be speaker. He sold his soul to be speaker. And I wanted that for him. I wanted him to get all of the things that he got uh, and and some more. Uh, but, you know, I go back to this thing with Iran and Israel. This is this is kind of a big thing. And um, all the responses that I'm getting is, you know, the world's on fire because of Joe Biden. This is all Joe Biden's fault, Bob. Uh, every red hat that it's reached out to me over the last couple of days, it's all been, you know, if Donald Trump were president, none of this would be happening. China wouldn't be going after Taiwan. Russia wouldn't be in Ukraine. Uh, everything would be perfect in the Middle East. There's this rose colored view of if Trump were only president, the world would be in harmony and we would all drink Coke. Well, first of all, let's go to Trump and Iran for one second. There was the Iran nuclear deal. And the first year of, and, and by the way, this was something that, this was something that was a control factor on Iran. It was the one point of leverage that the allies, the United States and its allies of the West, it was the one point of leverage they had on Iran, number one. Now, number two, it was, uh, you know, something that Iran was, was in compliance with and through the process of complying. So it would, reduce the amount of centrifuges, which makes less of a chance of a nuclear Iran. Now, the other problem with it is that Bibi Netanyahu uh, didn't like it, railed against the Iran deal, got mad at Obama over it. You know, they did everything they could uh, against Obama over the Iran nuclear deal. Trump gets in. The first year he keeps it because he has the secretary of state that goes to him and says, wait a minute, this is this is a leverage point. But in comes John Bolton, scary man. And of course, John Bolton has never found a war that he doesn't love. So Bolton comes in and he talks Trump with the new Secretary of State, Pompeo, talks Trump into undoing the Iran deal. And he said, they'll be salivating out of your hand, Bolton told Trump. And the next thing you know, after the shouting's done and we've got a new president, even Trump himself, in some statements, acknowledged that Bolton letting down the wrong path, you know, that it didn't happen. Iran didn't salivate. Uh, They didn't do what we wanted. In fact, there was less control than ever before. So that was one of the beginnings of an unleashed Iran was the fact that the nuclear deal was canceled and and you couldn't go back to it. Even Biden, who was part of the nuclear deal with with Obama, couldn't go back to it. So that sets stage one. So if we're going to talk about, you know, who's afraid of whom, 
once the nuke deal was canceled in the second year of the Trump administration, Iran had basically nothing to lose. And in fact, the moderates were thrown out and the extreme clerics uh, who run the uh, horrible government came in. So that's part of it. And then whether Trump was president or Trump isn't president or Biden was president or not president, Hamas was most likely, I would say 99.9% going to do the attack anyway. It's been a hot spot. It's been you know, a problem uh, since Israel has been Israel with the Palestinians and the Israelis. So they were gonna do that. So I don't think the, the threat was out there. This was coming. The point now is whether President Biden, and so far he's made the right statements, I think. I lived in Iran. I followed this issue. I worked with the issue in Congress. In fact, we worked with Biden's office and other offices at one point in time to look at communication over the nuclear issue. So Biden has responded and told Israel, you know, you're on your own. Now, Israel has built some goodwill. Jordan's airspace, Jordan hit some of the missiles incoming, Saudi Arabia, you know, didn't mind that uh, its airspace was used. But if Israel now retaliates, because the first hit was from Israel to the consulate in Iran, in Syria, Iran hits back, everything stopped luckily. Now, if Israel retaliates in a big way and Iran retaliates back, at that point in time is where Netanyahu may say to Biden, help us. They're retaliating back on us. Biden has made it clear, and I think rightfully so, that we are not part of this retaliatory strike on Iran because he doesn't want to get us into war, World War III in the Mideast. Lindsey Graham, he'd like to, Rick, we, we should actually make a fund, put a fund together so Lindsey can fly one of those jets over there himself. You know, he just, he's begging for a war. He says, you know, bomb Iran. John Bolton's all over TV now. You know, go get Iran. We should have got Iran before, et cetera. So Biden has made the right statement. We're not going to be part of a retaliatory attack. Here's the problem with it, though. If, in fact, Iran then responds back, do we step in? And that's a problem. And I think at that point in time, no matter who's goading Biden to get into a war, the Biden administration, I would say most likely you're going to say, we are not part of this. This is now between you and yep. them. No, that's and th where I think we'll go. And that's where I, I, I'm, I'm hoping... Uh, the Biden administration goes. And, and again, my fear is, you know, 2025 rolls around the potential of a, a new president. Uh, who knows what where Trump takes us and what he gives away? Uh, he's he's Mr. Art of the deal. Uh, what what does he end up giving away uh, to, to, to pretend to make peace for the short term? Because, again, I look at, you know, this, they keep telling me, you know, when, when he, Trump was president, there were no wars. And you go, well, yeah, how much did he give away? How much did he acquiesce to, to Putin and to other dictators uh, just so that they could like us? Right. And, and, and now, you know, the times have changed. Uh, who, who reacts or how Trump would have reacted? We, we don't know. Yeah. I mean, we don't know. All we know at this moment in time there are those trying to goad the president into a war. And I think the most significant statement Biden made the other day is we are not part of this retaliatory attack. Now, if Iran comes back at Israel, he needs to continue to say we are not part of these retaliatory attacks. We'll see where this takes us, especially over the weekend when we see what happens in the House on the vote to fund uh, right. some of this stuff. I got to get your thoughts on the uh, the impeachment uh, attempt of uh, Secretary Mayorkas, uh, I, I'm of the mindset, and I don't know that, that Schumer and the Democrats are, are doing the right thing here. I think let them have their impeachment. I think let them show what kind of a clown show that they are. And, you know, every time they bring up, you know, Mayorkas didn't do this, you go, well, what tools have you given him? You know, we had a bill, you shot it down. Uh, it seems to me that uh, by, th by, by stifling this, uh, potentially it could give it uh, more fuel. I'm curious your thoughts well now part of me says watching marjorie taylor green with her red hat on yeah on the floor of the senate that would be pretty good theater it would put a little clown nose on her and it would, it would be perfect <laughs> barnum and bailey no question about that so it's a tempting thought i'm going to go with schumer on this one get rid of the thing don't waste my time that's what he did uh, 51, 40, 49, because by the way, luckily the idiotic, I, I can't stand the cloture rule, the idiotic 60 vote rule that they have calling cloture to make something happen doesn't count 
in a in an impeachment um, that comes over in simple vote. But right. yes, if I was Schumer, I would. This is the problem. I would go through these all these scenarios. In fact, I'd probably give Marjorie Taylor Greene her own little microphone area there and let her. Hey, you I'd want mic her up twenty four seven. Take five. Take five. I would mic her up like they do on Sunday in the NFL, uh, and every word she utters, I think, because uh, you know, you, I, I agree with you. She's she's one of the worst uh, in in the in the house. Um, but for me, you know, the question I then come back to is, you know, does this bite Democrats in the behind down the road? It's uh, it's like you know, every time they do something, Republicans come back and use use something against them. Um, you know, is there any anything to that? Well, the problem with this one that, that I see on the political side, and that's why I think Schumer did the right thing to dismiss it, the Republicans would manage to use this as a field day you know, on the border and what Mayorkas didn't do. The impeachment articles on Mayorkas are so weak that, look, a lot of people just had to hold their nose to even vote yes. Is the border a problem? Yes, the border is a problem. It has been a problem. Congress has failed to solve the problem, so we let presidents, you know, respond to the problem. Obama did this. Bush did that. Trump, Biden. Uh, the Congress has failed on this. Uh, so I think that probably even Mayorkas himself doesn't become the issue. They, the Republicans would have just used pure border and people voting, yeah. you know, no, they're, no. they're coming across the border, and we know that's not happening, but they would have done that. So by by killing this quickly, I think that's eliminated. Now, the Republicans can come back and say, well, you know, Mayorkas, him in there is still, you know, making this a problem. I don't think it's going to change anything. I still think there's a border issue. Biden's going to have to make some executive decisions before the election to, you know, calm some of this down. So... I think getting rid of the Mayorkas uh, deal was probably in the best interests of the of the uh, Democratic side. I, I, my, my, my mind just keeps coming back going, let them have their clown show. Uh, same yeah, thing with impeaching cool. Biden. I think Raskin, uh, talking to, Com I think Comer, said, yeah, go ahead. Let's, let's, call, let's call him back now. Let's have a vote right now to right, impeach right. Biden. Because, again, they keep doing this stuff because they don't have an agenda. They don't have a policy direction. They don't have a vision for the country other than self-interest and chaos. And this feeds right into that. And while they also do this to satisfy people like Marjorie Taylor Greene, I mean, look at the speaker himself. He appoints her in the key position for the for the impeachment, and it's to, it's to keep them you know satisfied, yeah, keep them busy. Most members on the Republican side, let's face it, most members do not want to take an impeachment vote vote on Joe Biden. You know that, I know that, yep. they know that. But this keeps alive. Jim Jordan is keeping alive. The, the, the base out there, I know, in America, but the base in Congress. He's keeping them alive of, wow, we're going after him. Maybe we have a chance to impeach him. Yeah, and, and, and all they're doing is showing that, for me anyway, they're showing that they have nothing else and that this is all they have to offer, uh, which is chaos and, and insanity, because there's no there there on either front, the Mayorkas or the Biden front. So, uh this is where we are. But, Bob, as always, appreciate the thoughts, the info. As always, good stuff. Thank you. Our good friend Bob Nay. I want to hear your thoughts. Uh, on With me on the impeachment or, or, or not? Should, should we allow? Should we want more? Uh, more Republican craziness? I said let them be as crazy as they're going to be. Quick break. Right back. Saving work in America, one show at a time. The Rick Smith Show. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1857. That was the day that Clarence Darrow was born in Kinsman, Ohio. Darrow was perhaps the original U.S. labor lawyer. Known to be a friend to underdogs, Darrow once supposedly said, quote, Lost causes are the only ones worth fighting for. Clarence learned his concern for his fellow man from his family. His childhood home was a stop on the Underground Railroad. In 1887, Clarence moved to Chicago to pursue his law career. But his first big client was not an underdog. 
In fact, he ended up working as the general counsel for the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad. But then the 1894 strike by Pullman workers led him to quit his job. And instead, he defended Eugene V. Debs, the president of the American Railway Union. Debs had been imprisoned for his support of the striking Pullman workers. The case went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. Although Darrow lost, his reputation as a lawyer for labor was sealed. Over the years, he would go on to successfully defend Big Bill Haywood, leader of the industrial workers of the world, when he was accused of murder. Darrow's most well-known case, however, was the Scopes trial. Darrow defended a high school teacher, John Scopes, who had the audacity to teach evolution to high school students in Tennessee, something that was quite controversial at the time. The trial became a major news event. 200 reporters from across the nation covered the case. Darrow won, which was seen as a major shift towards the teaching of science in the classroom. Clarence Darrow is still beloved in Chicago, which holds a ceremony each year remembering his work as a champion of the people. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and the Rick Smith Show. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. And I know I should not want to see the chaos that we have uh, in our House of Representatives. I know I shouldn't want to see it, uh, but I think I think we need to see it. I think we need to see up close and personal just how dysfunctional the folks in charge of our U.S. House of Representatives are. And I look at James Comer, who is by far, in my view, one of the worst chairman in the House. And and that's saying some things when you start looking at some of the other people. He's been pushing this impeachment narrative, well, since day one. I mean, yeah, since the day he took over as the uh, as as the chairman, this has been their thing. And and Jimmy Raskin, you know, the other day he said, look, you know, tell me, what's the crime? What crime do you want to impeach Joe Biden for? You know, you want to keep this nonsense going. Tell us what the crime is. Tell the American people right now what it is. And and Comer's response is, well, you, you, you'll find out very soon. And I'm going, wait a second. That, that That's not very soon. How soon? Because uh, remember, this has been going on for almost two years now. This is this has been this has been their thing. This has been their thing. Uh, they promised us, you know, Joe Biden, we've, we've got the smoking guns. And yet at every turn, their smoking guns don't even turn out to be water pistols Uh, because there's no there there. And Comer, you know, asks uh, asks Raskin, uh, is it okay for China to bribe uh, Biden's family with nine million dollars? And Raskin's like, you know, wait a second. That's been discredited. You know, if Biden took a bribe and this is what I said from the beginning, if you have Biden taking a bribe, then impeach him. Hold the vote. But this this constant having these hearings to drag this out with, with no movement forward, it's the same kind of, it's a show. It's the bread and circus that, that keeps the base uh, of the Republicans going, see, they're, they're going after Biden, they're going to get Biden. They're not going to. There's nothing there. But it keeps people from asking, you know, what are you doing? Uh, it, it makes it look like they're doing something when in reality, nothing. And look, the, the wealthy people in this country, the, the, our, our, our 10 hundred billionaires, uh, the, uh, um, the rest of the, the, the shareholder wealth class, they, uh, they like the status quo. Things are going real well for them because we're not moving to raise taxes on the, the ultra wealthy. We're not going to close the, the max size truck loopholes that they're leaving in the tax code so rich people don't have to pay taxes. All the while, working people are struggling. We haven't dealt with inflation yet in ways that I think we should be, which is what, what? oh yeah, going after these, these companies that saw a great opportunity to gouge and, and fleece uh, the American consumer. And, and not because, oh, I'm, I'm going to, because they were all in on it. But we're not allowed to talk about that because we got to worry about, well, nonsense. And trust me, this, this unfortunately is nonsense. So bring the impeachment because I want to see what you've got. I'm somebody who wants to see what you've got. Show me. 
show me the smoking gun, show me the evidence, and if not, move on. There, there has to be something else you can do that would be a better use of the time that we pay you to be there. Uh, we don't pay you there just for the entertainment value. We pay you to actually get something done. That would be a novel concept. But we'll see. Again, uh, it's not going to end because, they, as I've been saying, they don't have a policy uh, agenda. They don't have a vision for the country other than chaos. And, hey, look at me. Uh, so that means the rest of us have got to do the ultimate in impeaching and throw these bums out come election time. Uh, that's what the vote is for, the ultimate term limiter. And all these folks who have shown us who they are, who have no idea of how to govern, uh, we should give them. We should get them jobs in the private sector. Just my thought. Want to hear yours? Email me, Rick at the Rick Smith Show dot com. Miss any portion of the program? Grab the podcast. Uh, miss any pro or the program? That also video free speech dot org. Listening to the Rick Smith Show. Email Rick. Email Rick at Rick at the Rick Smith Show dot com. Until next time, this has been the Rick Smith Show where working people come to talk. Remembering that united we bargain, divided we beg. Rick Smith.